it's another beautiful day and as you can see I have brought my beautiful wife out here to share with us another message from God's Word and I'm just so excited that we could just spend some time together and take you all for a little adventure outdoors as well so before we go any farther I'd like to invite you to bow your heads with me in a word of prayer to invite the Lord to go with us on our journey and show us things from his word father in heaven Lord we're just so thankful for your blessings towards us. And Lord, as we open your word and as we explore your book of nature, I pray that you will show us lessons, that you will impress our hearts, most of all that you will draw us closer to you. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you ready for an adventure? I'm ready. Are you? Let's head to the woods. Let's go. Following Jesus, what does that mean? What's the first thought that comes to your mind? You think of leaving everything, forsaking all, forsaking family and friends, everything that's fun and near and dear to your heart. You think of a boring life, or maybe, maybe a life of poverty and hardship and toil. What does it really mean to follow Jesus? That's what we're going to explore today as we go into the woods and on the lake. And let's find out what does it mean to follow Jesus as we follow his disciples. Travel back in time with me to many, many, many years ago. John the Baptist was preaching on the side of the muddy Jordan River. And his message was very simple. Repent, be baptized, and prepare the way for the Messiah. And so many people flocked to him. Crowds came to the Jordan River's edge. Uh, many did repent and were baptized, and many became John's disciples. Among these were John and Andrew, among others. And John and Andrew were devout followers of John. They realized that there was something that they needed that he had. They realized they were so excited because the message was the Messiah is coming and they longed for the Messiah. They searched the scriptures as they could and they were ready. Their hearts were longing for truth. They weren't hardened like the Pharisees. They weren't uh, doubting and unbelief, but they were looking for the Messiah. And then the grand day Jesus came to John the Baptist to be baptized. And I don't know that John and Andrew were even there, but we do know that they were there two days later. Two days after Jesus' baptism, he came by the same river where John the Baptist was. And John saw him and his countenance lighted up and he said, this is is he of whom I speak. After me comes a man that is before me. And John and Andy recognized. Most people didn't. They looked at the face of Jesus and they were like, well, he's some ordinary guy. But John and Andrew saw something. 
they recognized the Messiah. And so they began to follow Jesus. So the disciples of John, specifically John and Andrew, came and followed Jesus as he walked along the Jordan River. Jesus knew they were following him. He knew exactly who they were and why they were come. But he didn't let on. He just simply continued walking as they continued following faster and faster until they started to catch up with him. And then he simply turned. And we find in John chapter 1 and uh, verse 38, Jesus turned and seeing them following said, What do you seek? And they said, Rabbi or teacher, where are you staying? And Jesus said, come and see. And so these two disciples of John, John and Andrew, followed Jesus to where he was staying. And they stayed with him that day. And they were so excited at what they learned. And they could not wait to share it with someone else. And so we find in a few verses later, Andrew, Andrew went and found his brother, Simon, which we know as Peter. And he said, we have found the Messiah. Come and see, we have found the Messiah. And he brought him to Jesus. So Peter comes and of course, he's not sure what to think, right? All of a sudden his brother is hauling him out to, to see this guy who looks like a common man. And he says, this is the Messiah. This is the one that John the Baptist has been telling us about. And as Peter walks up, Jesus looks at him and he sees everything. He sees Peter's entire life from then all the way to the cross. He sees Peter standing up for Jesus. He sees his denial. He sees his forgiveness. He sees his repentance. He sees him walking on the water. He sees so many things and he sees him dying on a cross. And he looks at Simon and he says, you are Simon, son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone, also known as Peter. Wow. Jesus cared so much for his followers when he just barely met them, but he loved them and he had compassion on them and he could see their future. You know what? Jesus has that same compassion for us too. He loves us. And as we go through the rest of the story, we're just going to see just how much Jesus cares for his disciples. Jesus continued calling disciples, Matthew, of course, uh, Philip, Philip calls Nathaniel, J uh, John calls his brother James, uh, and many more. And soon he had quite a little family of disciples following him. They experienced so many miracles of Jesus. They saw the water turned into grape juice at the wedding in Cana. They saw sick healed. They met the woman in Samaria at the well. They saw Jesus patiently teaching and they loved their teacher. They loved their master and they learned so much. They were just like sponges soaking it all up. But they hadn't fully made the decision to leave all and follow Jesus. They were like part-time disciples. Follow Jesus for a while and then go back home and go back to their livelihoods, earn some income then come back to Jesus again. But then one day something happened that shook them to the core. John the Baptist, their beloved teacher, the man who first led them to the Messiah, was thrown in prison. Oh, their hearts hurt so bad. They were so discouraged. If John the Baptist is in prison, what would happen to Jesus next? 
Was he really the Messiah? Would he be the next one to be thrown in jail? Would their hopes be crushed? Had they followed in vain? These were their thoughts as they headed back towards the Sea of Galilee. The disciples went out fishing. Peter, James, John, Andrew, and out they fished. They fished all night long. They threw their nets out. They paddled to another place. They threw their nets out again. They pulled them back in. But they were not catching any fish. It was like the night of fishing matched their thoughts. All they could think about was Poor John the Baptist languishing in prison, alone, without any support or any help or any friends, tortured down in that damp dungeon. All they could think about was the priests and the rabbis and their bitterness and malice toward John the Baptist and towards Jesus the Messiah. They wondered what their future held. They wondered what the future of Jesus' ministry would be. What would happen next? Would Jesus be thrown into jail? Would they kill him? What would be the end? Oh, what bitter disappointed hopes filled their hearts. And as they continued fishing, and still the empty nets matched their discouragement. Finally, morning came and they hadn't caught a single fish. Not one fish! And then they headed towards shore in bitter discouragement and distress. As Peter paddled in from the whole long night of fishing, what was his surprise and astonishment but to find Jesus standing on the shore teaching the people. Jesus, on the other hand, had spent the night praying, and he got up early in the morning and came down to the Sea of Galilee in hopes to escape the crowds for just a little bit and enjoy the beauty of God's creation. But as he got there, well, the crowds of people found him pretty quickly and began thronging around him, asking him to share God's word, to share the kingdom of heaven and the truths that he had been teaching to them. They were hungry and thirsty and Jesus had compassion. So he began to teach. But about the time the disciples pulled in, he was so crowded over with people that he could hardly get his voice to be heard. He was crowded in on all sides along the side of the shore and he couldn't back up any further or he'd be in the lake. So he called out to Peter, Simon, can I step in your boat? And will you just push the boat out from shore just a little ways so I can stand here and teach the people? As 
So Jesus, from the boat, began to share the truths of the kingdom of God's word once again. And Peter sat in his boat, listening to Jesus. His hope and courage revived. He began to have that spark of joy again. Jesus was the Messiah. Maybe God could take care of them after all. And then, as Jesus finished his discourse, Peter was shocked as Jesus turns to him and says, Peter, why don't you just push your boat out into the lake again and catch some fish? <laughs> Peter, like, Peter's the fisherman, not Jesus, right? Like Peter says, Lord, uh, we, we've been toiling all night. We fished all night. We didn't get a single fish. Like, what are you talking about? Go out and cast our net now and fish? And Jesus says, come on, just try it. Just, just put your net out one time. And Peter, like, just, like, totally laughing to himself, says, okay, I'm just going to go to make him happy. Like, we're not going to catch any fish. He's no fisherman. He has no idea what he's talking about. But we'll go out, and we will throw out our nets. So Peter and Andrew push out in the boat on the Sea of Galilee, shaking their heads at Jesus standing on shore, laughing to themselves. Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about, but we'll make him happy. They throw their net out the side of the boat, kind of carelessly, not even expecting anything, when suddenly Peter felt a tug on the net. And it was heavy, and he pulled and he pulled and there was fish. There was fish full. He had never seen so many fish in this net. So he hollered at Andrew to come and help him. And as he's pulling the net into the boat, the net is breaking because of the weight of the fish. They fill their entire boat with fish and their boat begins to sink and there's still more fish in the net. So they holler at James and John to come and help them. And James and John come out and start filling the net into their boat and their boat fills with fish. And the boats both were starting to sink and the nets were still full of fish. And Peter was so excited. He forgot all about James and John and Andrew doing all the work. All he could think about was the lone man on the shore, Jesus. And he jumps out of the boat and he ran to the shore and he fell on his Jesus' feet. And he says, Lord, depart from me for I am a sinful man and Jesus simply says to him Simon follow me Peter looks at Jesus his eyes fill with tears Lord how can I not follow you you've provided all this fish I know that you can take care of our needs and then he sees Andrew and James and John coming to shore with their great big boatloads of fish and guiltily goes back out to help them finish. And as the four of them come back to shore, just all in shock at what has just happened, rubbing their eyes, could this really be real? And Jesus says to Andrew and to James and John, follow me, I will make you fishers of men.
they had no excuse. I mean, what more could they say? Jesus had just filled their boats with more fish than they'd ever seen in all their fishing careers. How could they not follow this man who could care for their every need? This truly was the Messiah. All their doubts were gone. All their fears were gone and forgotten. And they enthusiastically said, yes, Lord, we will follow you no matter what. So what are some lessons that we can learn from this story? There are many that come to my mind, but I want to share three with you. The first one is without Christ, our work is fruitless. We can't do anything without him. The disciples were out trying to fish on their own, toiling all night, working so hard, putting forth all their effort with no results. But then when Jesus came, filled their boats full of fish. But there's another lesson too. When Jesus called the disciples, he called them in little steps, step by step. First, he called them to follow him, but he gave them freedom to continue with their pursuits. But then finally, after they had seen miracles and after they had full assurance that he would provide for all their needs, then he bade them follow me. After he had a relationship with them, after he had developed trust, they knew that they could count on him for anything. They knew he would totally take care of them without a shadow of a doubt. And when he said, follow me, they were ready. And did God take care of them? Absolutely. Was it always easy? No. They had trials. But the joy and service for God, there was nothing that could compare to it. And God provided all their needs throughout the rest of their ministry for him. And then there's one more lesson. It's one that uh, we don't always think about. But God cares for us so much. He loves us so much. He says, Give, and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give to your bosom. For in the same measure that you give, it shall be given to you. Jesus says, give. Give all to me. It's not a sacrifice. It may seem like a sacrifice at first, but the joys that outweigh it, there's no comparison to the joy of following Jesus. And then one more, and that is when God called them to be fishers of men, not just fishers of temporal means, but fishers of men, he says, it's not your responsibility to change the hearts. It's your responsibility to work, to plant those seeds, to gather them in, but I am responsible to change the heart. God wants to work together with us. He wants us to be co-laborers with him. And he says, you be faithful and leave me with the results because I am with you. Friend, Jesus is calling you. Guess how educated those fishermen were? They weren't. They were ignorant, unlearned fishermen. But Jesus called them not because of what they knew or how amazing they were, but because they could be molded and changed for him. They were humble. They were teachable. And he could use them. And what a great and mighty work Jesus did through those simple disciples. If you aren't educated, it's okay. God still has a work for you. Are you scared? Are you timid? God can still use you. God says, give your little that you have to me. 
and I will multiply it just like you multiplied those fishes. And I want to share with you one little promise. It's become one of my favorite promises in life. It says, there is no limit to the usefulness of one who by putting self aside makes room for the working of the Holy Spirit upon his heart and lives a life wholly consecrated to God. There is no limit to your usefulness if you simply say, God, take me as I am, forgive me for my sins, and use me for your service. He will do that. He is faithful. Are you willing to let him, are you willing to let him use you? If this is your prayer, I ask you to bow with me right now. Lord Jesus, we want to be used by you. We want to be your disciples. You've given us promise that you will take care of our needs, that you will work with us, that you will teach us, that you will show us love, and that you will teach us what to say. Father, we're, we're so unworthy to be used by you, but we're here, your humble instruments. And I just ask today that you will forgive us our sins, that you will cleanse our hearts, that you will change us, and that when we fall, you will pick us up just like you did the disciples and you did for Peter. Lord, we consecrate ourselves to you today. And we thank you for your promises. We thank you that you have promised that you have a place for us. And we ask that you will make us fishers of men today, just like you did for the disciples of old. We thank you, we claim your promises, and we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen.